We're continuing with our worship and looking at the heart of worship and what it actually means. And we've, we've tried over the um, course of the last three months to get a grip on what worship actually is. And we've, I think, come to the, the concrete realization that worship is not a style at all. Uh, you can worship. Some people worship in rap. That isn't me. But some people do. In fact, I had one of the teenagers, well, he's, he's in his 20s now, um, text me yesterday, wanted me to go to a YouTube link and look up a song. And I, I went and looked it up, and it was a rapper rapping Jesus. And, and uh, doesn't bless me in the least, but I'm blessed that it blesses him because he listens to it. And it ministers to him. And he thought enough all the way from Alabama to call his old preacher or to text his old preacher and say, Hey, I like this song. Will you listen to this song? means there's a connection. And so it's not really so much about your style. Uh, it really is a lifestyle, and it takes a heart for Jesus to truly worship. Now, you can have a heart for a lot of things and worship it. Some people have a heart for things, and they worship them. Some people have a heart for uh, a, 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 maybe a husband or a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever, and instead of, it, which is there's nothing wrong with that, but there is when we worship it when we, we think about that more than we think about God. And so it truly is a heart for truly being what God has called us to be. Worship is also an activity, and this is the way it does. Worship is our response um, to God's revelation or to God's word of who he is and what he's done. And we spent just weeks just going over some of the things that God has done and shouting about it. And, and it's like almost, what have you done for me lately? Because we forget that God redeemed us through the blood of Jesus Christ, and so moving on to the next thing. But that in itself ought to get people excited in the church, hasn't it? That we are redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand not condemned by our sins, and, and that's an amazing thing. And so just that one thing alone ought to spur us on, our hearts on, to worship God. But last week we learned we were free to worship, and that was a beautiful thing. Remember in the Old Testament where they had to go through all the different rituals in order to worship, and it was just a certain select few that actually got to go into the Holy of Holies. Everybody else had to kind of stand at a distance from God, whereas now, through because Jesus is our great high priest and he entered the Holy of Holies for us, now we are free to worship God right now. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You get to right now. You don't have to, you get to. And so on Sunday mornings when you come into church, when we say, oh, stand up and sing a song, you get to sing that song. I remember years ago um, when I was, well, even when I was a teenager and a young adult, when I lived at home, my mama would never say, take out the trash. She'd always say, I'm going to let you take out the trash. I'm going to let you wash dishes. I'm going, well, thank you, Mama. That's just so kind. I was sitting here thinking about, well, how was I going to spend my day? And now I know I get to take out the trash. And I get, so for, worship is something you get to do. And it ought to inspire excitement within you. And I wonder sometimes if we're not excited about what God has done for us, how likely do you think people who don't know him are going to be excited? Excitement breeds excitement. And, and so we're free to worship. That ought to spur you on. But here's the, here's the one that I really like, and I, I want to show it to you in a story. But God inhabits our worship. In other words, wherever the worship is, God is. And, and I understand that God is omnipresent, so I get that. But there's something special, and I want to show you that. Um, in a story in Genesis. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to have the New Living up here. But if you have your Bibles, turn over to Genesis chapter 22. It's a familiar story that you'll know um, immediately, most of you, if you've been in church at any time, it's Abraham and Isaac and, and going up the mountain. And, uh, but I want you to look at it from the prospect of worship or from the aspect of worship and, and just turn it over to God, free to worship. and all. I just want you to look at it from that point of view. Sometime after, God tested Abraham's faith. So if you know anything about Abraham, you know that he had his ups and downs. He was very faithful at times. He was the friend of God or a call the friend of God. He, he did a lot of right stuff, but if you know anything about him, he also did some wrong stuff. And uh, he had his ups and downs like all the rest of us. And, and, uh, and so, but God is now doing a test for Abraham. He's testing Abraham's faith. So he calls out. He says, Abraham. And look at what Abraham instantly says. Here I am. You know, just, just right up. So you, you can already see that God speaks and Abraham instantly hears. And, and that one point you could spend a day on. 
God spoke and Abraham heard it. Now, I wonder how many times, because if you know anything about experiencing God, and if you've ever done that Bible study, you know that God is always speaking. Always speaking. Always speaking. We're just not always listening. And so for Abraham to be so attuned to God, to be so open to what God would say, that God called his name, and he, oh, here I am, Lord. And it was an excitement. You can hear the excitement. Here I am. Oh, here I am. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Whatever you want, I am ready. Have you ever been to that point in your life? I mean, there's been times when God called me and I wanted to hide, to be honest with you. And there's been times when I hoped he didn't call me. I remember when I first came into church in Elamville, Alabama, um, Brother Buford was the pastor in, in the church. We, at that point, weren't in the new sanctuary. We were in the old sanctuary, and there was about 10 pews on each side. The, the center aisle, there was no end aisles. There was only a center aisle. It wasn't even wide enough for you to carry a casket down. That's how narrow it was. And, and so we're in, that, in this small little room. I'd always been used to large churches. In fact, this was the smallest church we ever attended um, as it, uh, when I got on up. Oh, it, uh, anyway, this was our smallest uh, until then. When we got to Emmanuel, 25 folks on a Sunday morning was a, good, was a good Sunday morning. And so I go creeping in the back door of the church. I didn't want to be there in the first place. And I saw, you know, obviously where's the first place I go? I go to the back of the church find the biggest haired woman in those days the hairspray companies made a fortune because women had their hair up this high <laughs> and i found that woman to sit behind because i just didn't want the preacher seeing me i didn't want him calling on me and of course it was a it was an amazing horrific experience for me um but i, I sometimes we're that way with god we try to sit behind the big haired lady so he won't see us or notice us but i just want you to know there's no big hair that can hide you from god he sees you if you look in Revelation and you look at the, where he's speaking to the churches, one of the most, um, one of the wor or the thing that he says that is most humbling to me is he says, I know your works to every church. He says, I know your works. I know you. That's, 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 I'm thankful for that because I'm thankful that he knows my name. But that's a little bit horrifying because he knows me. He knows you. Here I am, Lord. And I wonder if we had that kind of excitement in our worship, and we lived in such a way that when God spoke, we just said, here am I. Man, what a, what a walk that would be, right? And this is, so here's the good news that, that Abraham gets. Why don't you take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love so much, and I want you to go to the land of Moriah. Oh, you want to go on a little field trip? Take my boy on a little field trip. That's nice. How nice. So far, we're all in on this. You know, just take your son and, and notice how it's worded. I want you to take your son, your only son. Now, we know that's not accurate in that he had another son, Ishmael. But God never recognized Ishmael as another son. He only recognized Isaac because Isaac was the son of promise. But take your son, your only son, whom you love so much. And I want you to go on a little road trip. Abraham, and at this point, Abraham's still, whoo, I'm all in. Until you get to the next part of verse 2. I want you to sacrifice him. Go and sacrifice him. And, and we could think that it was talking figurative if he hadn't said as a burnt offering. So literally what God is saying is, I want, instead of the lamb... I want you to burn your son for me. I would have been all in until right there. Because now, now you have to make a choice in your worship. Now, now is where having a relationship with the one that you worship makes all the difference in the world in how you react to something that doesn't make sense. Because Abraham knows that God is a God of love. But he also knows that he's a God. He is God. And so in Abraham's mind, he's got to judge in a split second for him. He's got to judge and he's got to, he's got to weigh that love against the love he has for Isaac. And which of those two loves is greater? Because it's very easy for us to put our children as a God, isn't it? It's very easy for us to put things before God. That's the test. That's the test. Who do you love more? And it isn't really that God needs our love because he doesn't. God doesn't need anything. He's complete. 
but he deserves our love. And because of who he is, he demands our first love. And because he created us and holds all things together, and because he is sovereign, he has the right to ask for that. In fact, you wouldn't have breath unless God gave it to you, so you wouldn't have had a son to begin with unless God gave him to you. And that's a proper perspective. That's how to see life. But we, we don't see it that way because we don't have a spiritual mind. We see it as, well, you know, life is pretty much all about me, and God is really there to make sure that I'm comfortable, that I'm safe, that I'm, I'm, I'm relatively well off, and things kind of go my way, and people like me. And, and, and I, want, I just want you to, that's a misconception. That isn't who God is, and that's not why he's there. So I want you to take your son, and I want you to burn him on one of the mountains. I, and, and listen, I'll show you when you get there. I'll show you when you get there. And, and so Abraham has to make a choice here in his worship. Again, it's between Isaac and God. And so verse 3 says this, The next morning, Abraham got up early. And the wording is important. Because I'm going to tell you, if God came to me and said, Randall, um, I want you tomorrow, uh, I want you to go and take Laura's life. <clears throat> I wouldn't get up early to do it. Early the next morning, the first thing, he gets up. The Bible says that he saddled his donkey, he took two servants with him, and he took his son Isaac. They chopped wood. Can you imagine the pain in Abraham? The, the confusion in his head, the pain in his heart as he is chopping wood that he knows his son is going to go on. As he's chopping that wood and getting ready to head out to a place that God sent him, can you imagine what that feels? I have no reference point from that, but those of you that um, have children, just imagine... God saying to you, take your favorite and sacrifice him. He did just exactly what God told him to do. And on the third day, and this, is, this is after they got the wood chopped, they headed out. Three agonizing days. Now, there's a lot of symbolism between this and Jesus Christ. If you can't see it, you'd be blind. But the third day, on the third day, of the journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place at a distance. You know, on day one, it would have been hard, but you still got day two and three. So you're walking along with your boy. Can you imagine the conversations? Because Isaac has no clue. The servants have no clue. The only one that knows the pain that Abraham is going through is God. And so here, day one, and Abraham is talking to his son. And you, can you imagine that every look, he looks intently at his boy. I mean, he wants to memorize every feature, every moment. He wants to take advantage of what. So day one goes, it comes, it goes the morning of day two. And, and well, I still got all of this day. And, and, and then day three, he looks up and there it is. And can you imagine once again what has happened in Abraham's heart when he sees that place? And he knows God's command. And this is what he says. Stay here with the donkey. And Abraham told the servants, and the boy and I will travel a little farther. But I want you to see his worship because he's about to show his true. I mean, he's already showing who he is as a man. But he's about to show his worship right here. We, talking about he and Isaac, we will worship there. You see that? He, he tells the servants, okay, y'all stay back with the donkey. You take care of all that. Isaac and I are going to worship. That's what we're going to do. But, but look at the next words. And then, look at what it says. We. It, it, he doesn't say. He's not lying here. Then we will come right back. That line tells you everything about Abraham's heart. 
Because he knows that while he's been asked the most horrific thing, he knows who his God is because he has a relationship with him. He doesn't know how God's going to do it. Maybe God's going to have him take his own son's life and resurrect him out, out, of, the, uh, uh, out of the fire. Maybe uh, he, he's going to all of a sudden rush in. He doesn't know. He doesn't know, has no clue. And, and we know the story. We know the rest of the story. So he didn't have that kind of foresight. He only knew the moment-by-moment -moment action, but he knew in his heart that God was going to do something. Because that was their relationship. And he said, so listen, we're going up that mountain because that's what God has required us to do. We're going up that mountain to worship. And I wonder how many of us have that kind of relationship with God. Now, now please don't misunderstand. You have to grow into that. Abraham didn't just get there, did he? Remember, he had bumps in the road, just like you do, just like I do. He had bumps in the road as far as his worship was concerned. One time he built an altar in a place he wasn't supposed to, and it came back to bite him. And it just, just a lot of things where Abraham didn't get things right sometimes. But in this particular case, he has matured to the point that his relationship with God is so close that he knows God is going to do something, so he's just going to do exactly what God said and trust that God will handle the details. We will come back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. The lamb is carrying his own wood. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? He carry the cross? Same thing. Same, same story, basically. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. A lot of symbolism there. But. So the two of them walked together, and still, Abraham's humans, so don't lose the humans out of him. His knees have to be a little bit shaken. So this is, now, I want to show you how generationally you affect each other. Because Isaac is Abraham's son. Isaac looks over at his dad because he's been trained. He knows what's supposed to happen when you sacrifice. Why? Because his dad has shown him over and over and over. He knows what's happening. Now, he doesn't know he's the lamb, but he knows there's supposed to be one somewhere. And so Isaac looks at his father and says, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, we have the fire and we have the wood, but where is the lamb? Where's the sheep? We don't, we, we're, we're missing something. Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if you had trained your children so well to when they walked into a church where the Holy Spirit was missing, they'd know it. Or when a preacher was up preaching and he wasn't preaching the Word of God, your children would know it because you had trained them so well that they would, might not know exactly what's missing, but they know something's not right. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? Abraham had spent so much time with the boy that he loved talking about the God that he loved that his son knew instantly, Dad, something's missing here. We don't, we don't have everything we're supposed to have. And I don't want to get up the top of the hill and have to walk back down for our lamb. So could, where's the lamb? For the burnt offering. Uh, verse 8 is worship. God will provide. You see that? God will provide a sheep. Now, is Abraham wishful thinking? Or does he have confidence in who God is? He's still going through the motions. I just want you to understand, God has not released him to say, okay, you got it, son. Now you don't have to go any further. You've got this. Every step is agonizing because while Abraham trusts God, he doesn't know what the delivery is going to look like, and he may have to and is fully prepared to take his son's life because that's what his God has commanded. But when his son asks where the lamb is, son, God will provide. And they both keep walking together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him, Abraham built the altar and arranged the wood on it. And can you once again imagine his heart? Because still, God hasn't come through. Still, God hasn't come through. He hasn't said a word to them since they left home. That is recorded in the Word of God. Not one word has been spoken since he's left home. So he's still following through with the last thing God told him to do. He's going all the way through with it. 
And so he builds the altar, and he arranges the wood on it. And then he tied his son. And this is the thing that it's so much symbolism here between Isaac and Jesus Christ. What most people, most scholars believe that Isaac wasn't a child here. When we see pictures of it, it's always pictured as a little boy. But the thought is, from most scholars, that Isaac was probably 21, 22 years old at this point. Easily able to overcome Abraham. But he didn't. Why? Because he trusted his dad. That was their relationship. The Bible says he tied his son and laid him on the altar. In other words, he didn't struggle because, you know, a guy that age, even a child, um, you'd had to knock him out to keep me. I'm telling you, you're going to have to knock Randall out to keep him on a pile of wood that somebody's about to catch on fire. I mean, I'm not stupid. I'm going to wiggle at least. But not Isaac. Why? Because he trusted his father. And Abraham trusted his father. You see how generationally we affect, our worship affects us. Just as people generationally, when we don't live the way we're supposed to live, that affects the generation behind us as well. And, but if we live the way we're supposed to live, if we trust God and our relationship with God is what it's supposed to be, then we are affecting and maybe infecting or inspiring our generation to be more than they could be had we not lived. And that's exactly what's going on with Isaac here. He laid down on the wood, and Abraham picked up the knife. And so that there's no, so that there is no confusion about his intention, the Bible is specific. Why did he pick up the knife? Not to prove something, to kill his son. Now, all of this whole story reeks of crazy to me, doesn't it? I mean, because who does that? Who does that except for crazy people? Or that's, this is the kind of stuff that's on a horror movie. He picked up the son to kill, to kill his son as a sacrifice. So you need to understand, he wasn't wanting. He was doing what God told him to do. And at that moment, God is always on time. The Lord called. I want you to understand, in his worship, God was present. He's an ever, always, he inhabits our praises. He inhabits our worship. In fact, he inhabits us through the Holy Spirit, does he not? Wherever you are, he is. And, and what happens is when you release him, that's why the Bible over and over says, don't quench the Spirit. In other words, live in such a way that the Spirit flows freely from you so that you are always in right relationship with him, infecting it, and affecting the world around you and the people around you for his name's sake. That's what worship is. Our response to who he is and what he's done in the presence of even craziness. We're still just going to trust our God. In our generation, we're being told that wrong is right and right is is wrong and some of us are believing it some of us because it's so easy to go with the flow it's easier just if we don't stand and fight if you don't stand and say you know what i'm not going i'm not no god says this and that's enough for me i don't care what anybody else says my whole family can go that direction but if god says this is the way then this is the way i'm going to go that's worship. Going the way of the world is not worshiping God. That's being a coward. Abraham just simply chose to trust God. And of course, <laughs> he calls, I bet you, now this is just pure Randallology, so, uh, but this is how I read this story. I bet you when God called this time, Abraham was even faster than answer. Whoop, here I am, God. <laughs> Can you imagine? Because the first time he called, hey, yeah, I'm here, God. The second time, Abraham is just hoping that somebody's going to call. And just, Abraham, here you are. And, of course, God says, don't lay a hand on the son. I know that you truly fear me, and you have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Jesus says something in the New Testament that is shocking to us. Um, he's talking about being a follower of his, and, and people mistake this scripture, but if you could see it in light of Genesis 22, it would really kind of help 
to see. He says, unless you hate your father and your mother. Remember that scripture? Jesus is talking to the crowd, and he says, you've got to hate your father and mother. And, and in a sense, Abraham had to decide to hate Isaac. And, and the word hate there, if you look it up, it really is the word, get it in its right order. You, you don't have to hate your father and mother, but what you do have to do is have them in their right place. And some of us live more by what mama says than we do by what God says. You've got to love God more. And that really is the gist of the Scripture here. And when Jesus is saying, that is the gist, is God first? Is my love, is my obedience, is my allegiance to God greater than it is to my mama, greater than it is to my wife, greater than it is to myself? Is it greater? Because then, when that's in proper perspective, man, does stuff start happening around you. I understand in this room that because we're, we're human. I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that Abraham was a human too. And if it's possible for Abraham, it's even more possible for us because Abraham had God with him. We have God in us. It's a, a difference. And so I, I understand. But here, here, here's my thought, and I, I just want you to kind of think with me rationally for just a moment. Since we have God in us, Shouldn't we strive every day to be better today than we were yesterday? My goal, now I, I would love to stand before you. I wish I could stand right here and say, God is first in everything in my life. And I want him to be. I truly do. Just I think as much as all of you really want God to be first in everything, but he's not. And, and God is always in a process with me of showing me, just as he was with Abraham. I think if he had done this with Abraham in an earlier day, Abraham wouldn't have grown to the point in his relationship to have been able to follow through. Does that make sense? But because Abraham has grown in his relationship with the Lord, and they are close, and he knows his God because he spent time with him, Abraham is now to the point in his life, in his maturity, that he's ready to take that step. And I wonder what step you're on in that process, because for most of us, we're not taking steps. We're just standing still. And I just want to tell you that standing still worship is not really worship at all. It's apathy. It, it is being content with not being what God's called us to be. Not growing in our relationship. I, I, I take steps. I, I am purposeful. Now, sometimes, granted, because I'm a human just like you are, sometimes I take two steps forward and then three steps backwards. Because I'm a human, and just like you. I have, I have things in my life, whoo, I'm running like a marathon, and boy, that's no problem for me at all, and I'm just going a full-fledged for God. I mean, whoo, 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 but then there's other stuff. Don't touch that, God. Don't touch that. And what he's done in my life and in my experience is he knows who I am, he knows what I'm capable of, and so God at the right time knows just exactly when to stick me, <laughs> and he does. But what if God didn't have to stick us every time? What if we just, out of our love, remember, worship is about your heart. And what if we could live in a fresh awareness of just how good our God is to us, and then in that line, spend time in his word, growing to know him better purposefully, and then in knowing him better, growing in our relationship, and then seeing something in our life that we know doesn't line up with the word of God, and removing it ourselves. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? Wouldn't that almost be like a love letter to God? God, I don't, I'm not going to wait for you to stick me. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I'm, I, I, I love you. You know, the best gifts in marriage, the husbands, you listen up to this, and wives, you sh you'll shake your head in agreement. The best gifts in marriage are not the ones that are asked for. They're the ones that are spontaneously given from a heart that adores the person they're giving it to. It's the best gifts. Unexpected, 
but incredibly heartfelt. And guys, you want to make yourself a hero? Don't do it because of this, but just look at your wife and cherish her and just spontaneously do something that you know is going to light her up. Not in a bad way. Light her up. Man, because it's your heart. It's your heart. You're doing, and, and if she has to ask for it, <laughs> Valentine's Day, sure would be nice if I got a dozen roses like all the rest of the women in the office. I hadn't had it in 15 years. <laughs> year after year, I watched the ladies get their roses. I hadn't had any. <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if she didn't have to say those things to us, guys? And women, wouldn't it be nice if your guys just did that? Now, here you go. Now, you have to understand, we're wired a little differently, so we don't often think that way. But we should. Men, out of gratitude for who our wives are, we should. You should see something that you know lights her up and get as much pleasure out of giving it to you as if she had given you a gift herself. And if, and if a wife deserves that, how much more does God deserve that? And so that's what I want us to do in worship this week is, is, is uh, God is present and he's in, you're saved or at least you're by profession of faith you're saved. So you have the Holy Spirit within you. So why don't you just, you know, in, in the next few moments, I'm just going to give you just a little bit of time. Why don't you just think about the one thing? I don't, I, you know, I'm not in your life and I don't have a crystal ball so I can't read what that one thing is. Why don't you just get that one thing? Just one thing in your life that you know is not pleasing or not according to the Word of God. It could be a, a bad thing, and I'm not going to go through the list because I'd leave one out. Or it could be you know you're supposed to be doing something and you're not doing it. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be, well, that's still a bad thing, but him that knows to do good and does not, to him it's a sin. So it could be something you know you're supposed to do, you just haven't. But regardless of which it is, I just want you to get that one thing, and this is what I want you to, to do. God, give me the strength and help me to overcome, to repent of that, remember? To be sorrowful for it. And that kind of sorrow results in repentance, and repentance results in true joy. So just help me to repent from that in my own life without you having to stick me with something. You'd be amazed, I think, at what you'll find. Mm -hmm.